Good morning. Good morning. Happy Easter. Have you broken your Lenten feast already? Did anybody go home for a breakfast of hot chocolate, chocolate croissants, and chocolate biscuits? Anybody want to admit to that? Well, you've all done very well. We give you a warm welcome to worship this morning uh, on this Easter Sunday. Um, as we come and remember uh, that Christ is risen. As Ivan and I were, were chatting before and, and, and thinking about coming in here, uh, we were thinking that actually um, on the strength of Easter Sunday, we worship Sunday by Sunday. And the promise and the reality of the truth of the gospel, Christ is risen. Very few announcements this week, um, just with, uh, I suppose, Easter week, it's a bit of a break. Uh, tonight, we're coming back again at 7 o'clock, we'll meet over in the Bright Room uh, for a time of praise and, and some prayer, along with our brothers and sisters from Island McGee and Whitehead. As you know, we've been doing some Common Ground stuff, um, and there's still uh, more that we're going to do. Remember, our Holiday Bible Club uh, during the summer is a combined effort, and there'll be more details of that over the next lot of weeks about how you can begin to get involved in that and, and how you might be able to support that. Um, one of the things we'll, we'll be looking for is if you have maybe a bit of extra space in your house and uh, you love Americans, um, this team who's coming over from America, uh, we need to put them up for the week. Um, I hear the love hamburgers and all sorts. And you can teach them about Ulster fries and all those other bits and pieces. It's only bread and breakfast uh, you need to do, but we, we will feed them uh, within the churches during the week. Uh, so there's lots of things to get involved in, not just in the teaching, or sorry, not in, in, in the helping during the holiday, I believe, uh, but also then in the sort of practical support around that. July 16th, I think so. Uh, that's for the Americans. For us in, in Northern Ireland, it's beginning the 16th of July. Just so that you understand those, those things. But again, tonight, 7 o'clock, if we can make, uh, it would be lovely uh, to see you here. I hope you saw Rosemary on the way in. <coughs> looking at her. All gone. There's still some there. Uh, some chicks and that is money that goes towards the work in the lottery. Um, and so if you can support that, um, she's willing to take IOUs, um, <laughs> spectacles that you'll be able to, to get back whenever you pay her uh, the £1.50 for the checks. Um, but we pray indeed that God will bless that work. As we come to worship, let us hear the words from Luke's Gospel. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee? The Son of Man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners, be crucified on the third day, be raised again. Then they remembered his words. When they came back from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the others. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the others with them, who told this to the apostles. But they did not believe the women, because their words seemed to them like nonsense. Peter, however, got up and ran to the tomb. Bending over, he saw the strips of linen laying by themselves, and he went away, wondering to himself what had happened. Well, we know what had happened. We continue on the gospel accounts and into the New Testament. We know indeed that Jesus rose from the dead. And so we too rejoice in the hope of the glorious resurrection as we join together to sing our first hymn, See What a Morning.
Let's unite our hearts in prayer. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, when we recall that first Easter, it seems like the end of everything. For when Jesus died for us, the hope he had brought was gone forever. He was laid in a tomb, and a stone sealed the entrance. His followers had watched him suffer. They'd heard him draw his last breath and sobbed as his limp and lifeless body was lifted down from the cross. For them, the cry, it is finished, had a different ring to it. But as the women went to the tomb, they discovered the stone was rolled away, the tomb was empty, their confusion turned to fear. As the angels announced the good news that Jesus was alive, just as he said. So we too draw near to you this morning with our faith and doubts, with our joy and sorrow. We come in peace but restless, but help us to remember your word to us. That we have hope when all seems hopeless. That we have confidence when the ground is shaking beneath us. That we have strength when the burden is too heavy to bear because we are not alone. For you have given us newness of life. And that we share in the victory that Jesus won for us on the cross over all the darkness of this life. As we are reminded once more of the assurance of eternity to all those who know. For our foundation is sure. As we look to the risen Son of God, glorious and exalted. And it is upon this rock we stand firm in the knowledge that we, he will be with us always, even to the ends of the age. So may our faith arise today. As we look to the empty cross, the empty tomb. And pray that you may fill us to overflowing with your Holy Spirit. To the glory and honour of your name. For we ask these things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Who taught us to pray saying. Our Father who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Boys and girls, if you want to come and join me at the front. And so on. And many, many moons ago, there was a little poem written about a lamb. Anybody know what it was? Absolutely. And the story goes that it, it came from a school teacher who had a, a child came to school, but the lamb followed her. And as she brought the child in, the child sat in the classroom, and they could look out the window, and this little lamb sat outside all day until they finished all their lessons, and then when they went out, the lamb was so overjoyed, and they jumped to see her, and was really, really excited, and she took the little lamb home. Mary had a little lamb, its fleece was white as snow, and everywhere that Mary went, the lamb was sure to go. He followed her to school one day, and that's where it sort of comes out of that story. 
But there's another idea. Sometimes we think at Easter about the Lamb of God. And it goes back in the Old Testament times. It goes back to Moses and the Israelites and them coming out of Egypt. And when they celebrated the Passover, they would eat lamb and there would be a lamb sacrifice. And then, as we said last time we met, it protected them. As it was killed and they put the, the, the blood over the doorposts and so on, the angel of death that came over protected them from that. And that's how they got away from Egypt. Pharaoh eventually let them go. And so when John the Baptist comes along and he sees Jesus walking ready to begin of his ministry, he says, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. And so we think of Easter, of, of Jesus as the Lamb of God. But it sort of all ties in. There's somebody else wrote a poem that talked about that and it sort of summed up the idea of having sort of the, the two, how would you say, boundary markers of Christmas and Easter. I saw something on social media, I think it was last week or during the middle of the week, nine months to go. With a quarter of the year done, with only three quarters to go, and then it'll be Christmas again. Are you excited? Where has that time gone? Has it, has it gone fast? You see, if you think it's gone fast, it means you're getting old. That's a scary thing. You see all these folk out here, they're probably thinking, gosh, tomorrow's April. How can that be? Where, where did February go? What happened to March? It just seems to be a blur these days. But this is what it says. Mary had a little lamb. He was born on Christmas Day. She laid him in a manger bed to sleep upon the hay. That's the beginning of it. But as the person who wrote that poem sort of skips along and talks about Jesus as he's grown up. But then it says this about Easter. Mary had a little lamb, but he wasn't hers, you know. He was the very Son of God, the one who loves us so. The father of this little lamb loved the world so much that he sent his only son to earth so we could feed his tongue. He came to give us joy and peace and take away our sin. So when he knocks on your heart's door, be sure to let him in. Why do I love this precious lamb? What can the reason be? The answer is quite plain to see. It's because he first loved me. You see, that's what the cross is about. I know we, we hear such terrible things and it was an awful way to die but it was because God loved us that he allowed Jesus to come and back Jesus willingly hung on the cross because he loved us he loves us so much but he, he wants us to respond in faith and that's what we'll be chatting to the grown ups later on this morning to respond by faith to believe that yes we need a saviour we need this lamb who, who takes away our sins and that we believe that it's Jesus who's done it. We confess that we have lived for ourselves but we want him to lead and direct us. Because he loved us, we want to respond to that. Surely if somebody's nice to us, we're nice back. Do you ever watch Mega Man? That sort of blue alien and what's the other boy called? Metro Man. Metro Man. That's it. I saw just the start of that yesterday. And he was this one who was really good and one who was not so good. And every time he did something, he got it wrong and time over time he just seemed to get more and more into trouble and then he would say, well, do you know what? If I'm getting into trouble all the time, I will be the worst ever. And then he creates all these plans and and sometimes we can decide, well, we're just, we're just not wanting to accept this love of God. We're just going to do our own thing, live our own life. But we just end up going further and further away from God. But when we realize how much God loves us, well, then we need to respond to him and share that faith. 
And the good news is that this love was finished. God's plan of salvation is not that it changes day after day. It is now set in stone forever. It was finished upon that cross. We're going to sing a new song this morning before you go out. And I know there are fantastic things uh, organised for you this morning. Um, I've got quite a lot of work that needs sort of tidied up. So Libby's going to get you to shred it for me and, and put things together. And, uh, it's not really chores, it's a game. <laughs> it's not that at all, it's okay. But here's this wonderful, wonderful new thing to remind us. He declared his work is finished. He has spoken his, his hope to be. It is finished upon the cross. Now, because I hope you listen carefully as we did this before the start of the service that was playing, Try again now this morning. Let's stand and watch.
we turn now to Paul's letter to the Romans. Now Romans chapter 3, and we'll begin at verse 21. So we've been thinking about the message of the cross. And so today we look at the cross explained. Romans 3, verse 21. But now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known, to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness, because in his forbearance he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time, so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. Amen. May God add a blessing to this, the reading of his holy word. During the week I saw a little bit of that coverage of the Baltimore Bridge tragedy. It seems so unreal it could collapse so quickly that a ship hitting one of the stanchions uh, would take the whole of the bridge down. But as I understand it is built on one, it was literally one length of steel. And so once one platform, one stanchion collapsed, the rest would just go with it. But one of the commentators uh, on the, in the news was speaking to an expert that obviously got all sorts of folk out to, to speak about how it could happen and, and the implications of it all. Uh, and so when he was explaining, yes, it, it was there, it was just uh, a suspension bridge or whatever it was that once one of the foundation stones went. And the man said, so it was an accident waiting to happen. If there was no things in front of it, no barriers, obstacles to stop a boat hitting it, it was an accident waiting to happen. Somebody's to blame. Somebody should have done something. So that could never have happened. It could have been avoided. We start to think, I wonder how the families of those who are lost feel about that. That their loved ones working on the bridge. It could have been sort of, somebody should have done something. And we've seen that before. Advertisements, if you've had an accident at work, get in touch and we will sue. If there's been an accident, somebody's to blame. Don't our insurance companies tell us if we have a car accident, a bit of a bang in the car, don't admit to anything. So that we can create even wriggle room for ourselves. And we do that all the time. Always somebody else's fault. We can always find some reason. Remember actually working in the civil service many moons ago and would change the sort of setup of the, the various departments, the different sections. Um, and we were dealing with something and uh, with one member of staff who perhaps was not as industrious as others, let me just put it like that. And so he was part of our team and the boss came to us and said, why are you behind and my other supervisor friend, well, he left in. Well, didn't we take that chap? Nobody else wanted him. He wasn't industrious. We're already sort of one arm tied up behind your back, and we've taken on this new work, and we've done this, and we've done that, and you don't know the pressure we're under and stuff. And in the end, the boss apologised to us that somehow it was his fault that we were behind. That was okay in the first couple of months, but surely nine months down the line, we would have got over that. And yet, every time we were asked about it, he went back and went and rehearsed the same argument. We always look for somebody to blame. But the cross was different. You see, the person who accepted the blame was not at fault. Pilate could find no fault. We thought about that last week, that there was no reason to charge Jesus. As we read during the week on one of the nights, 
He was also sent to Herod because he was Galilean and it was under Herod's jurisdiction. And he sends him back to Pilate again because he could find no fault. No reason for him to act. No charge could apply to the perfect spotless son of God. Yet he became sin for us. He accepted the blame for us. See, Paul has just concluded in Romans chapter 3 that the law only helps us to be conscious of our sin. Because we realise none of us have ever kept the law. We realise that none of us can be totally righteous by ourselves. Paul actually says we're not even aware of what we're doing when we do wrong because our conscience doesn't prick us. And maybe that's utterly shocking to hear that we are sinners because we tell ourselves and we tell others we don't do anybody any harm. Augustus Top Lady, I think that's a great name uh, for a hymn writer, he wrote that hymn, Rock of Ages. One of the verses he says, Not the labours of my hands can fulfil thy law's demands. Could my zeal no respite know? Could my tears forever flow? All for sin could not atone. Thou must save and thou alone. Commentators say that those six verses in Romans 3 are at the centre and heart of the entire letter. But they also go on to say that this is the most important paragraph of scripture ever written. That here is something we need to take note of. Something we need to memorize. Something that we need to really grapple with. Because it tells us about the heart of God. But now, reverses the situation. We're told it is a, a way which has been made known to us. It reveals, it appears. And what it actually means is when it talks about it, it signifies a completion. It has been made known. This is it. It's not a mystery as we understand a mystery to be. But it's something that God continues to reveal his covenant promises. The way in which God will draw us on to himself. So when Paul says the law has done away with this, it's quite strange for somebody who was brought up in pharisaical circles. He sat at the feet of Galileo, or not Galileo, Galilee, and, and had this sense of, of being taught. The law is not done away with, but only as a means of salvation. It's not about being good enough. It's not about trying to hit the target. And Jesus says in Matthew 5, he did not come to abolish the law and the prophets, but that not a stroke of the pen, a comma, will pass away. It's not our own ability. Because he goes on to say that our righteousness needs to exceed, it needs to be better than the Pharisees. But how could that ever be? They followed the law of religiousness. He says our righteousness needs to be better. But the only way it can be better is because of what God has done for us. The righteousness of God is given through faith. Most of us, I think, have probably filled out a CV or a resume when we've applied for a job. There we highlight all the reasons why the company should pick us and not somebody else. We try to convince them that we are the greatest thing since the sliced loaf. We're the best on offer. But what Paul is really saying is that none of us meet the mark. None of us are good enough. You see, whether we are in the bottom of the mine or at the top of Everest, none of us can touch the stars. None of us are of the right caliber. And that would be awful if things remained like that. 
But now, as Paul says, this righteousness is given to us. The cross changes the situation. It's a right standing before God. It is a relationship restored. And something offered to us freely. This is God loving, stooping down, coming to us, giving grace to us in Christ. He says it's given to those who believe. But believe is not an emotionless, factual understanding. It's not a, a realization that there is a God, a, a higher being in us. But it's a heart transforming realization of what we are really like when we stand before the Lord. And that the only way that we will change is if we bow at the cross and ask for mercy. When we realize we need Jesus as our Savior because without him we are lost. But it is open to us all. The Jews had failed to live up to their end of the bargain. And as we've been thinking in our Bible studies over the last few weeks that the fact of it being extended into the Gentiles, they've no reason to be arrogant. But that God is still at work, both with Jew and Gentile alike. But none of us are outside of his grace. Neither too bad nor too good. But we're all in the same boat. We all fall short of the mark. That may offend. But it's what scripture teaches. When Jesus talks about blessed are the poor in spirit. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. He is talking about those who realize they have a poverty before the Lord. When he tells us that we are to leave all behind. And come and follow him. The law reveals our brokenness. Our relationship between us and God is broken. We are separate. I was down at the, how would I describe it, the Easter display or, or Easter reflection in Whitehead Community Centre on, on Friday morning. Um, Whitehead Presbyterian were running it. And it was a visual expression. There was lovely artwork. There was uh, passages of scripture to reflect upon but one of the ones that really sort of spoke to me was they had two of these sort of blowing up globes those plastic like what I call them, beach ball type things and one was fully inflated and one was deflated and so we had the globe the world as it should have been perfect in all its glory and then because of sin the reality of the herb taken out of it a brokenness a scrumpled mess it reminds us of this situation. We have all sinned. We are lost. We are broken. We are helpless. We fall short of the glory of God. God is love, but God is also just. And we want that. We believe that. Because we want God to deal with the evildoers in the world, don't we? We want him to act and to to work against them and that has been our argument why does God let this evil and suffering happen why does he let them get away with it but our difficulty is we think of others why does he let them get away with it not why does he let us get away for we all have sinned we all fall short sin is a rejection of God a disobedience to God it offends God the cross he deals with. There are 580 mentions in the Old Testament of God's wrath. There are 20 different words to describe it, but it's not like our anger. It's not unpredictable. It's not vengeful. But sin must be punished. God's anger must be satisfied. The Gettys wrote about that in their well known him now till on the cross as Jesus died the wrath of God was satisfied for every sin on him was laid here in the death of Christ I live 
sin separates. But it leads us to the wonderful conclusion, the wonderful answer that God has made away. These words that we find here of justification and redemption are words that we find in the law courts in the slave market. In Jesus' time, the justice system was incredibly personal. The accused stood before or against the accuser. And there was a judge and it was all done in public. It was out in the courtyard. And so somebody could bring a case to the elders of the, 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 the people. And the judge would rule. The consequences were grave because if you offended another person, if you were found guilty, that not only would you receive a sentence, but you probably would also have been shunned, banished, Commun excommunicated from the community. When we think of forgiveness, we might think that Jesus pardons our sin, he lets us off. Yes, pardon means that we may go with and let off the penalty the sin deserves, but justification is something even deeper, something greater. It means there's no basis for a charge against us, no ground for punishment exists. Instead, we have the bestowal of a status. We are adopted into God's kingdom. Our relationship is renewed. Think of it. You receive the summons through the court. You have to go and stand at a particular time. And you go there and before the magistrate. And he looks and he says, I'm sorry, I have no trace of anything against you. There is nothing here. You're free. It doesn't happen. But this is what God has done when he justifies it. It's a free gift. But it comes at a cost. It is the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. And that word redemption, again, is part of the slave market. Slaves were the property of their owners until someone paid the redemption price for their freedom. Some who was willing to step forward, we think of that idea of a kinsman redeemer. We read of that in the story of Ruth where Boaz realizes that there's somebody else who could pay the price, somebody who was closer and should step up and he deals with them and then he steps in. When he marries Ruth, he pays the price. We said the children, the Israelites were slaves in Egypt. They understand what it is like to be set free. Well, Jesus comes in a much greater way to set us free. Free from our sins. Free from our separation from God. And because he paid the price, there is no charge against us. And we are brought into this wonderful new relationship. But there's something else in this. This shows the uniqueness of the Christian faith. For other faiths and other religions, it's all about working your way to God, that if you are better, if you care for others, if you do this, if you do that, well then you're going to get closer to God, you're going to be more God-like. But instead, God comes to us as we are. And offers us this wonderful free gift of mercy, forgiveness, of redemption. We have to believe, we need to trust. And in doing so, what we're really saying is we will bank our life on it. We will give our all to God. Because he took my fear. It's a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood. We go back to Leviticus 16 to hear about this. Every year the high priest would come and, and two goats would be brought in. One would be sacrificed as he prayed over it and, and, and laid uh, the sins of the people and be sacrificed and worship. And the other would then be driven out into the wilderness, the scapegoat. The one who has to be blamed for everybody else's fault. But it was a yearly event. There are wonderful words, expiation and propitiation. 
Words that you will never probably use in a lifetime. But it helps us to understand what this spirit of atonement means. If there's a debt that is owed, expiation means that our sins are dealt with. It disinfects us, it wipes us clean. We understand that when we think of what we went through through the pandemic. But propitiation means that we must also appease. We need to pacify the offended party. And so atonement deals with both. An offence needs to be taken away. An offending person is found guilty. But somebody is made right, made whole. And that's what God did, or what Jesus did for us. He provides a way that the offence is to be dealt with. Quite simply, God himself gave himself to save us from himself. It was God's grace that turned away our wrath. It was his son who died and bore our judgment. It was God's mercy poured out on the undeserving. See, there's nothing we can do or contribute that would or could have paid what was owed. Therefore, we must do is exercise faith in Christ. To receive what grace offers. We can't do it. But Jesus did it. He paid the price. That's why he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? <clears throat> that he accepted the separation. The sins, our sins, my sins. Were laid on him. You see, there's here's the reality of this life of forgiveness. The sacrifice given for us. But have we received it? Well, the hymn writer wrote, Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing blood? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you fully trusting in His grace this hour? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you walking daily by the Saviour's side? Do you rest each moment in the crucified? Are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless, are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? You see, when we come to the cross, we realise we are to blame. We were guilty. We admit that we are sinners. But then as we stand there and we see what Jesus has done for us, we believe he died for me. It was the only way. And so the only way to be made right with God. The only way to receive his salvation is to confess our need of the Saviour to cleanse us and to trust in what Jesus has done for us. And he grants to us a new life, to us who have done nothing to deserve. That's the That's what it was all about. A way by which we might be made right with God. Not working through it in our own strength. Not working through it in our own power. Trying to earn our goodness. By following law. By following rituals. By following a religion. But now there is a righteousness unlike any other. But this Easter morning, can we say that this is real for us? Let's pray. Father, convict, we pray. Challenge us. Comfort us. Cleanse us. That as we stand before the old rugged cross, when we think again of what Jesus did as he took our place. 
to deal with the sins that needed dealt with, but to show God's love to a world of a way by which we may be right with him. Help us not to ignore it or turn away, but to receive this gift of atonement, this gift that would set us free. we might indeed hear heaven rejoice of one soul who was lost but comes in faith believe for we ask it in Jesus name Amen <clears throat> and so we sing praise again oh to see the dawn let us stand and worship.
Let us pray. You see, does this resurrection make a difference? Does it make a difference in our everyday life? It should, because we live knowing that victory has been won. So our lives should be transformed. And as we are transformed, as we stand forgiven and go in the name of Christ, then the communities around us may also receive that grace, that love, that transformation. Our gracious God and loving Heavenly Father, through the sacrifice and blood of Jesus Christ, you have won the victory that through faith, by grace, we can be saved. So we turn to you and surrender ourselves. Change us, close us with your righteousness. Fill us with your spirit that we may be dif the difference in the communities in which we live and work and pray. We pray that there will be a change in our world. A change for the better. For we know your will can be done here on earth as we open ourselves up to your guidance. So we pray for those places where there is a human need. We pray for those in poverty. We remember the homeless, the sick and the hungry. We pray for the victims of war, the refugees, for divided communities and countries. Father, we especially remember Palestine this morning. We cry out to you for peace. We pray for Haiti and Ukraine. That God, in your strength, you will move in the hearts of others. That you will move in their minds, that your hand will, will, will move in a powerful way. Lord, that we will realise as we begin to look. We might see the world through your eyes. That we might see others with the compassion that you have poured out upon us. And that you may challenge us individually. For what we can do. In service of our King. We pray for the sorrowful, the fearful, the troubled in heart and mind. Pray that your peace may be upon them. Those in our families who are maybe struggling with difficult situations. Lord, that you will draw near to them. That your love will surround them. We remember the oppressed the persecuted, the imprisoned, the exploited. Father, we rejoice in our own freedoms as we were able to worship, worship in public this morning without any fear. We pray protection over our brothers and sisters from those who would seek to do them harm this Easter. Those countries around the world that to profess Christ will have you locked up or worse. Again, we think of our brothers and sisters in Palestine who are unable to cross over to Jerusalem on this, this special day where they have worshipped for years, celebrating the risen Christ. May the truth of Easter break into each and every situation, bringing help and healing, strength and support, comfort and courage, Faith and freedom, love and life. The change alone that you can bring, but help us to be the eyes, the ears, the voice, the hands, the feet that will answer someone's prayer. We know that you can accomplish all things, but help us never to be a stumbling block to your work, but to respond in love and action as we hear you command us to do. For we ask our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. And so we conclude our worship with that wonderful hymn.
reminding us of the glory of the risen conquering sun. Thine be the glory. <clears throat> risen conquering sun. Endless is the victory. Thou <coughs> over death. Spirit be with you now and remain with you all.